The Vietnam War is arguably one of the most complex and multifaceted topics in history. There is continuing debate in differing schools of thought regarding why the war was fought, why it failed, and who was ultimately responsible. While many factors went into forging and shaping the course of the Vietnam War, the U.S. withdrawal in 1973 played an unambiguous role in the collapse of South Vietnam. The Paris Peace Agreement of January 1973 was fatally flawed by moral, legal, and political compromise, and the United States' involvement in the agreement did not ever guarantee South Vietnam's security or the United States' honor. To understand this today, I want to present three things. First, we're going to broadly look at the conditions of the peace agreement. Secondly, we're going to attempt to look at some of the flaws of the peace agreement. And finally, we're going to look at the results in the aftermath, what happened as a result. So first, I want to broadly look at the conditions of the peace agreement. There were four parties to the agreement. The Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which was communist North Vietnam. The Republic of Vietnam, which was non-communist South Vietnam, backed by the United States. The Provisional Revolutionary Government, which was the political face of the South Vietnamese Communist Insurgency Group, the National Liberation Front, also called the Viet Cong. The Provisional Revolutionary Government was their political face and was an alternative South Vietnamese party in this treaty. And the fourth party was the United States. The conditions of the agreement were as follows. There would be a ceasefire January 27, 1973. The United States was required to remove all naval bases, military bases, mines, and soldiers within 60 days after the ceasefire, and the U.S. would also receive back the POWs from the Vietnamese. Regarding Vietnam, the South Vietnamese Army and the Communist National Liberation Front in South Vietnam would both cease warfare with one another and remain in place. Neither side would be allowed to introduce new war material or new forces, although both sides could replace war material that had been damaged on a one-for-one -one basis. The National Council of National Reconciliation and Concord would be created with representatives from both of the South Vietnamese parties, and the goal of this council was to organize new elections and a new government in South Vietnam. The ultimate goal was that there would be a peaceful reunification between North and South Vietnam that would be settled without U.S. involvement or interference. Noticeably missing from the treaty was any condition requiring the withdrawal of North Vietnamese soldiers. As you can imagine, that was a very important issue, and we'll come to that in just a minute. First, now, let's look at the flaws of the Paris Peace Agreement. I've organized this into two flaws that I want to highlight today for the purpose of this presentation. The first flaw was not upholding South Vietnam's political sovereignty. The Paris Peace Agreement recognized the Provisional Revolutionary Government as a valid legal and political entity representative of the South Vietnamese people. As I had mentioned, the Provisional Revolutionary Government was the political face of the National Liberation Front, the communist insurgency group in South Vietnam. Early in the peace talks of 1968, the United States had recognized the National Liberation Front as a participant in the talks in an attempt to gain momentum and leverage with North Vietnam. The National Liberation Front had quickly set up the Provisional Revolutionary Government, which was recognized by North Vietnam and the Soviet Union as the legitimate government of South Vietnam. However, historian Larry Berman describes the Provisional Revolutionary Government as a puppet regime with no shred of independent legitimacy. Recognition of the Provisional Revolutionary Government was opposed by the South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu. Thieu rightly argued that the NLF, the National Liberation Front for which it stood, was a communist minority insurgency group backed by North Vietnam. It was not a legitimate South Vietnamese political agency representing the people. In his understanding, insurgents and guerrillas were not an equal rival or alternative to his own Republican government backed by the United States. And consequently, recognition was an ideological and diplomatic victory for the communists that undercut South Vietnam. Furthermore, the treaty did not, did not recognize the 17th parallel separating North and South Vietnam as a political boundary between two sovereign states. The agreement merely read, the military demarcation line between the two zones at the 17th parallel is only provisional and not a political or territorial boundary. Essentially, the treaty did not recognize the existence of two distinct Vietnamese states, one communist and one not. It left an ambiguous situation requiring future reunification but leaving both regimes in place. Again, to quote from historian Larry Berman, the existing government in Saigon would remain in office, yet no national boundary would formally separate North and South Vietnam, meaning that two governments were running one country. In these ways, the United States failed to uphold the political sovereignty of its ally, South Vietnam. The treaty, the second flaw of the treaty, was that it allowed the North Vietnamese troops to remain in place in South Vietnam. This is probably the most obvious flaw of the treaty. How is it to be mutual if only one side was required to withdraw? 
The treaty did not speak to the issue at all. It basically said that any future settlements would be decided by the Vietnamese and that the United States was not allowed to speak into this issue. This concession to allow the North Vietnamese troops to remain in South Vietnam had been made by the leading U.S. diplomat in the talks, Henry Kissinger, as early as 1970, several years before the final agreement was concluded. Kissinger writes, in arranging for mutual withdrawal, we did not insist that the North Vietnamese troops be placed on the same legal basis as American forces. Essentially, Kissinger is arguing that it was not necessary to legally treat the North Vietnamese forces that had invaded South Vietnam as the same legal basis as American forces, as legal belligerents in the same understanding. Kissinger claimed that this was a diplomatic necessity unless the United States wanted to fight to a total victory over North Vietnam, something he believed was untenable. However, Larry Berman attacks this understanding. He writes, It is true that both sides made concessions in order to produce the final accord. But the concessions made by the United States were much greater and far more detrimental. The United States abandoned the principle of mutual withdrawal, which allowed the North Vietnamese to pursue their long-range goals of unification. And to clarify, by unification, I mean the military subjugation of South Vietnam and the creation of one communist nation ruled by the North Vietnamese. The concession to allow the North Vietnamese troops to remain in South Vietnam was a major compromise on the part of the United States that gave in to the communist key demand. So now we turn to the results and aftermath of the peace agreement. What happened as a result? Prior to the ceasefire on January 27, 1973, the National Liberation Front and the North Vietnamese forces in South Vietnam both put out major attacks in the few days leading up to the ceasefire to grab as much territory as they could before the ceasefire took effect both sides were trying to raise their flag in as many places as possible before the lines were drawn in an attempt to hold as much territory as they could. Consequently, the ceasefire did not really result in a cessation of hostilities at all because both sides kept up the warfare, justifying their ongoing violence in the face of the other side's infractions of the treaty. North Vietnam continued to send war materials and forces openly into South Vietnam in blatant defiance of the stipulations of the agreement. The only definite actions accomplished were those in which the United States had an immediate stake, namely the return of American POWs and the unilateral withdrawal of American forces. The National Council for National Reconciliation and Concord was never created, and a domestic Vietnamese political settlement and reunification never occurred. In 1973, when the United States withdrew, the war was far from finished. The only difference was that the U.S. was no longer involved. This leads us to ask a very obvious question. Why did the United States make no attempt to stop this bladed North Vietnamese belligerence in the face of the so-called peace? The United States President Richard Nixon had promised South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu that if the North Vietnamese continued their warfare against South Vietnam, the United States would back up South Vietnam with bombing raids, as had been done before in the Easter Offensive and the Christmas bombings of 1972. However, the U.S. never followed up on this promise. Shortly afterwards, Richard, Nixon, Richard Nixon's actions were halted by the Watergate scandal unfolding on the home front. Even if Nixon did intend to follow up on his promise, the Watergate scandal and his own political failure guaranteed that there would be no further U.S. military aid to help South Vietnam. Furthermore, the U.S. Congress voted to ban all further bombing and military aid to South Vietnam in 1973 and again in 1974. Nixon resigned in August 1974. Meanwhile, in North Vietnam, the North Vietnamese continued their invasion of South Vietnam over the course of 1974 and 1975. Historian Arnold Isaacs points out that 1974 proved to be the second worst year of the entire war with over 31,000 battle deaths. Peace was far from being at hand. South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu resigned from office April 21st, 1975 in light of the upcoming disaster. The Americans and South Vietnamese personnel in Saigon were evacuated from Saigon by helicopter and boat in the few days leading up to the collapse. The North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces took Saigon on April 30th, 1975, bringing to an end a non-communist South Vietnam and accomplishing the military reunification of the Vietnams under one communist government. So what can we learn from this? We cannot help but see that the United States acted dishonorably in the entire affair of the 1973 Paris Peace Agreement, the several years of negotiations leading up to it, and the subsequent withdrawal from Vietnam. In short, the Paris Agreement provided an opportunity for the United States to get its forces out of South Vietnam and to get out of the war without being militarily defeated or without having to take the immediate blame for what happened. The peace agreement, though, was not forced upon the United States by the communists. It was orchestrated by the United States with major concessions to the communists on almost every front. The promises and rhetoric of Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon were manifestly fraudulent. Kissinger called the agreement a decent settlement with peace and dignity. 
Nixon writes, I had pledged to continue fighting until I was convinced that we had achieved a peace that was worthy of our sacrifices, that preserved the independence of South Vietnam, that had a chance of lasting after we had withdrawn our forces. Nixon's own words seem somewhat self-incriminating in light of what happened. The collapse of South Vietnam was due to the Paris Peace Agreement, orchestrated by the United States and the U.S. withdrawal. Vietnam was a tragedy, but it was a culpable tragedy. America's guilt was that in beginning a war to protect a free people from the savagery of communism, it handed over a free government into communist slavery to save face when it realized there was no longer public or political support to fight a prolonged and misjudged war. America's guilt in Vietnam was not that it became involved in the war in the first place. It was that the United States signed an agreement that guaranteed continuing war and the destruction of an ally and called it peace. Thank you for listening. At this point, are there any questions?